Good morning. Welcome to St. Ansgar's online edition. Our services are being held in the library today because uh, they're doing the floors and the stage in the sanctuary and uh, they're working on cleaning up some of the dust and such in there. Um, so we come to you in our library here at St. Ansgar's. Thank you for joining us this morning. A couple of announcements as we begin here. Uh, as you may have heard this week, Leanne Chamberlain passed away on Tuesday. Uh, she was out for a walk and uh, she stumbled to the ground. Some neighbors saw her and began to do CPR. Um, they rushed her to the hospital, but uh, she passed away on the way there. Uh, they think it was probably a massive heart attack. Um, I've been in touch with Lori and George, and uh, we are planning for a memorial service this summer as uh, there are no gatherings that can be uh, taking place here at the church at this time. Also, on a bright note, we see that uh, the Andrew and Esther had their baby on the same day, Tuesday. Uh, they had a little boy, Arlo, and uh, they are safe at home and uh, uh, just walking through this time together. Thankfully, Esther's mom was able to come down and help out, and uh, she will be here for, uh, well, as of this, this um, taping here a couple days, but when you hear this on Sunday, she'll have been gone on Friday. Um, also, in thinking of communion, uh, this next week we're going to be having opportunities for communion here at the, the church. Um, people can call and uh, set up appointments. Uh, we'll have a certain time slot. I'll be sending out an email this week early on Monday about those time slots so you can email me back or call in and let me know if you would like to receive communion. Uh, we'll have uh, protective things in, in place in regard to the virus, but uh, we'll have this opportunity for Confession, Communion, Absolution, and uh, an opportunity for you to partake in the real presence of the Lord in that moment. Uh, those are our announcements today. We are continuing to speak at Council. Well, we'll be talking on Tuesday about this, about steps to um, perhaps have a drive-in service if that's what they decide to do. Uh, I know we're still probably about a month or more out from actually being able to meet together uh, in regard to Governor Newsom's uh, force phase plan that he has in place. And so that's it for today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 111, verse 1. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them full of splendor and majesty in his work, and in his righteousness it endures forever. We would like to take a moment here from St. Ansgar's and wish all of you a happy Mother's Day. You're worth it. The song that we're going to play for you today is called Lilac Bouquet. Um, Miss Rory presented it to us, and it just, it hit me. I'm like, I, at first I was like, oh, but that's so country western or whatever you want to call it. But I just kept listening to the words, and it, I, I'll put the words down below. You'll like it. It's a good one. I just opened. I could see mother's teardrops on every line There on its pages the fragments still lay A faded blue ribbon and a lilac bouquet Oh, the orchid's so tender and the lily's so fair Or the blushing red rose could never of mother and how she would say thank you my son for the lilac bouquet the birds the birds are still singing around the old home there in the field where I used to roam beneath the old tree there's an old lonesome grave where the angels came So 
fair Oh, the blushing red rose Could never compare To my memories of mother And how she would say Thank you, my son For the lilac bouquet Let's continue to pray with the words of the Kyrie in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For St. Ansgar's Lutheran Church, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
Cheryl Howington here. Um, miss everybody really big time. I hope you're doing well. Um, Pastor Stroud asked me to call and give you guys an update of what's going on with me and how I'm faring through the shelter in place, quarantine, etc., etc. And uh, my husband and I were doing fine. Uh, he's working from home. My dining room table is his office. And I go into the office every day and uh, keeping pretty busy because we're shorter staffed and so we're having to cover for more so my very heavy desk is even heavier um, but that's okay I have a job and I'm thankful for it one of the things that um, has affected me the most with quarantine is hearing how scared everybody is how frightened they are oh my gosh um, what if somebody I know gets sick uh, what if I lose my job? What if, what if, what if? And uh, it makes me sad because I know people, some people are just terrified of what might happen. And the sad state of the things is that they just don't know Jesus. And uh, that makes me sad. And some of the people I've shared with, they still just don't, don't want to accept it. And uh, so for that, I'm sad and they're very fearful. Um, what else do I do to keep pushing through? I read my devotionals in the morning, um, play with my dogs, look forward to my bike rides with Brenda, and uh, sit outside here in my sanctuary in my backyard while the birds make noises like the crow that's up above calling at me, and uh, just try to get through this, shelter in place, go to work, wear my mask, I have some silly ones that are pretty fun. Um, but anyway, I hope everybody's doing well. I look forward to seeing everybody as soon as we can. I'm a huggy kind of person, so I really miss um, being able to see you guys and hug you. And uh, I know that it'll be elbow bumps for a while, but that's okay. And at the end of the day, when all is said and done, God's in control, and he'll get us through this. Thanks. See you soon. God bless you. Come on kids, it's a worship time, let's go down to the barnyard church. Come on kids, it's a worship time, let's go praise the Lord. Praise Him, praise Him. Hey Dad, what are you doing? Hey Owen, I'm making cookies. And while I wait for the cookies to get done, I'm reading the Bible. You know when you make cookies, you got to have a plan. And the Bible also talks about a plan here in Jeremiah 29, 11. You want to hear it? Well, here it is. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, when you make cookies, you have to have a recipe. That's like a plan, right? And in your recipe, you have all these different parts. You have vanilla and butter. You have eggs, sugar, flour... You like the sugar mm. and your know, flour, and then you have uh, chocolate, right? And you have baking soda. Wait, oh. I don't like that. Yeah, you don't like that part, huh? Well, you know, life's kind of like that. There's parts we like and there's parts we don't like, okay? Like, when you get older, you have to work hard. You might like your work, you might not like your work. But, um,. There's things that might happen that are sad, things that hurt. There's, there's different parts to life, right? But God says that he has a plan for you to bless you and to not hurt you, to give you hope, okay? Hi. Yeah. Um, well, while we're waiting for the cookies, why don't we do a puzzle, okay? You know, your life is kind of like a puzzle. You have all these different pieces, right? And when you look 
at a puzzle piece, you can't really see what the puzzle is going to look like from each piece, right? Can you see what this puzzle is going to be like? Can you tell? I think it's going to be like a train. A train? Because you saw the box? <laughs> well, it is going to be a train. But um, each piece is what makes up your life. And if you let the Lord lead you, then he's going to make something beautiful out of your life. Just like, like what you said. It's going to be a train, right? When it's all done. But it'd be hard to tell that it's going to be a train by looking at one piece, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, as you go through life and you have all these different pieces in your life, just remember that the Lord is putting those pieces together. And He is going to uh, bless you with His plan for your life. Now, what happens if you try to take one of these pieces and... Put it together in a way it's not supposed to go. Is that going to work? No. Yeah, you might end up with an ugly puzzle, huh? Now, was that the way the puzzle was designed? Do you think these pieces are supposed to go together like that? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, God's plan for our life is like that. He has a plan, but we need to follow his plan. Now, with those cookies, what happens if I just put nothing but baking soda, the stuff you didn't like? They're not going to be very good cookies, huh? Yeah, well, that's like our life, too. So we, we need to follow God's plan for our life. And if we do, he will bless it, just like uh, just like he promised in his word. Hey, I think I, our cookies are almost done. Do you smell those? All right, now that, that's like the blessing of the Lord right there. See that? So if you follow God's plan, you'll be blessed. All right, cheers. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Here ends the reading of the scripture lesson. Would you continue to pray with me? And Father God, these are your words, and I pray that you would use these words now to encourage us, to help us to understand your ways and your plans for us. Uh, fill me with your words today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine preaching for 40 years, but the lion's share of your messages were gloom and doom. Hardly a message about grace. Hardly a message with mercy. Rarely anything besides judgment, judgment and warning. Intense opposition from your countrymen, including beatings, imprisonment, and isolation, shedding tears without number as the Lord reveals to you the extent of his anger at his people Israel. This was the ministry of Jeremiah, also known as the weeping prophet. During his ministry, he saw apostasy, idolatry. Uh, he saw uh, the people turning away from the Lord, moral decay. Long gone were the glory days of King David, when God's favor and blessing rested heavily upon Israel and they seemed to not be able to lose a battle and, uh, as uh, David led them out into war there. Jeremiah proclaimed the word of the Lord to five different kings during his lifetime. And for the most part, because of his negative message, he was living alone. No wife or kids, few friends, enemies at every turn. A little bit of the history of Jeremiah. He was a, basically a pastor's kid. Uh, he was the son of one of the priests of Anathoth, which was a small village about three miles to the northeast of Jerusalem. He'd seen his father during his ministry, uh, sacrificing for the sins of the people, um, observing over and over as those sins increased in his day and all around him. And when it came time for Jeremiah to step into that priesthood, God called him to become a prophet. He chose him to be a voice of warning against the people. Idolatry was rampant at the time, even being practiced by most of his contemporaries. 
And so the Lord chose Jeremiah to speak this message, prophesying that captivity was coming if the people didn't change their ways. Well, unfortunately, they did not change their ways. They continued on in their sins, and judgment did finally come. The Babylonians were on the warpath at the time. They were being led by their merciless king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was marching down the coast of the Mediterranean there, really on his way to Egypt to fight against the pharaohs there. And so Israel was just a stopping point on the way. He besieged Israel, surrounded it, um, and finally captured it. And then in 597 BC, he began to ship most of its inhabitants off to Babylon, where they were in exile for 70 years. Right smack in the middle of 96 pages of judgment and doom in the book of Jeremiah's prophecies, the Lord inserts a message of hope that's intended for these exiles. In this text here we're focusing on this morning, it relates to as much, uh, us as much today as it did to the Israelites over 2,600 years ago. Uh, first of all, we see in this message from Jeremiah that God has a plan. Brothers and sisters, we are in exile. As God's chosen people, we live in a world that is dominated by a cruel and merciless dictator. You know him as Satan or the devil. In John 14, 30, he is called the prince of this world. And in 1 John 5, 19, it expands on this by saying, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Notice that distinction, though. We are children of God, not of this world. Yet we are not at home in heaven. We are still here, exiles in a hostile country. At times it may have seemed like God has forgotten about us, isn't it? And we may think even at some points, uh, perhaps God is busy running the universe and he's not going to bother with little old me. Israel probably thought the same thing when they were being let off uh, in shackles to Babylon. Perhaps they thought maybe in their sin they had gone too far. Maybe God had rejected them as the chosen people and he was focusing on a different nation now to bless them. Maybe they were to become his chosen people. And that's why it's so shocking, I think, uh, to see these words in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Shocking because prosperous was probably the farthest thing from their mind as they were led off into Babylon, into this new nation, a strange country with unfamiliar language and customs as slaves. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit because I've jumped into the middle of the letter that he wrote to the exiles. I'd like it to back up a little bit to verse 5 of that same chapter, and we see the beginning of God's message to them. He says, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And so even in the midst of exile, God had a plan for them. He had not forgotten them. Essentially, he's telling them, don't give up hope. Even though I'm disciplining you, I still have a plan for you. You are still my children, and my plan is for your well-being, prospering them. And so, they were still his beloved children. Wouldn't it be fantastic if once we were saved, we were whisked off to heaven, and we wouldn't have to face all the turmoil in this life, the pain that we face now? We wouldn't have to live with the uncertainty of a pandemic. We wouldn't have to watch our loved ones die like we had to watch Leanne die this week. We wouldn't have to wonder what kind of pain and suffering our children were going to face in this life. Perhaps the thoughts that Andrew and Esther have about their new son, Arlo. We would be at home with the Lord in the promised land. But in God's wisdom, that is not his plan for us at this time. We are here in this place, in this community. We're to build houses, marry, work, have children, bless our communities while we are living here in this hostile country. Does this all seem a little strange to you? 
When you look around the world and see all the pain and suffering that's taking place, even among your Christian brothers and sisters, does it strike you at depressing at times and maybe overwhelming at other times? Do you lay in bed at night sometimes and wonder if all the turmoil is worth it? I know that I do. I know that the exiles in Babylon probably did. I found myself wondering maybe if a different plan for the world might have been better off than the plan that we see now. I've pondered this question this week and I was listening to a segment by Ravi Zacharias. Uh, He was on a show that was a question and answer show. And the question that he received was, how could an all-powerful, all-loving God allow evil to exist? His answer was very profound. He said, we must look first at the four different possibilities that God had when he was deciding about how he would create the world. The first possibility was he could have decided not to create at all. The second possibility was that he could have created an amoral world where there was neither right or wrong. The third possibility was he could have created creatures that had no ability to do wrong. And the fourth possibility is the world as we see it beings who have a choice to do either right or wrong. And then he went on to say something that really hit me. He said that fourth possibility is the only world in which love is possible. Love is only possible in a world where we have a choice. A robot that's pre-programmed can only do exactly what it's intended, what the designer intends for it to do. It has no capacity to love. It has no capacity to choose. It's just executing its program. Now, how God was able to create a sentient being that has the ability to turn against him is beyond um, this sermon, and that's actually beyond our capability to understand. And the reason it's beyond our capability is that as humans, we have not been able to create a sentient being like that. The closest we can come in regards to comparison to this is children. And even those we don't create, we procreate. Meaning that God has created them, we are just the vessel by which they come. And even though we have influence over them, we don't actually have control. And they can eventually become whatever they want to become. Eventually they can choose a destructive path. They can choose evil. But in our heart of hearts, we still have a plan for good for them. We still are cheering for them, even as they're walking away from us many times. It's a plan of prosperity. It's a plan of success. This was God's plan for Israel. And even though they had rejected him as their father, they were chasing after pagan gods. He still loved them. He still wanted them to return to him. Even though we may sin, God still desires for us to return to him. And that brings us to Jeremiah's second point in this prophetic letter written to the exiles. The plan results in finding God. We talk a lot about people finding God as if he were something that was lost that we needed to look for. A better analogy, I think, would be hidden treasure, though. God is like his hidden treasure. He's there all the time, just beneath the surface of the world around us. He's hidden behind the sunset as you stand on the ninth green at Pebble Beach and look out on the ocean. He's hidden behind the printed words on the page of what we call Bibles. He's hidden beneath the structure of your family life. He's even hidden underneath the surface of the pandemic. We just need to look for him. But many people cannot see God, even though they might be looking at the very same thing that we are looking at when we do see him. They look at a sunset and see only millions of years of chance and evolution. They look at the words in the Bible and only see fables and myths that try to prop up people's faith. They look at the family structure and see only a survival mechanism. And they look at the pandemic and see only senseless pain. In Proverbs 25, 2, Solomon says, It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. Now, why would God want to conceal himself? Why is he kind of a hidden God, so to speak? Well, I believe the reason God is hidden because he wants us to seek him out. He wants us to seek his wisdom and become dependent upon him. It's humbling to say that we don't have the answers, that we don't have it all figured out, that we need to seek answers from God. 
But I want you to notice here that humility is the royal way. Because in Proverbs 25, Solomon says, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. Royalty humbles itself and seeks out the answers that it doesn't have for life. In Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13, Jeremiah says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What does God mean here by then you will call upon me? When is he talking about? I believe it's when Israel had been in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. They'd been marrying, building houses, having relationships, seeking the welfare of the community they were in. But they were longing for their home. They were longing to return to Israel and see the prosperity of their country flourish. This seems to be common among God's people, both past and present. The world, the flesh, and the devil are all trying to distract us away from God. For the Israelites, it was much more blatant than we see today. They had nations surrounding them that worshipped idols. These were statues of wood or stone that had demonic presences behind them. And Israel and Judah began to find God's laws to be tiresome and a heavy burden. They looked at the people across the border and thought, well, they look like they're enjoying themselves much more. They look a lot more prosperous than we are in their lives. Maybe their gods are less demanding than ours. And at the very least, they have an image that they can go and bow down to. All we have is this hidden, invisible God. In the West, we might not be tempted by something so blatant as a statue, although I've seen many statues creeping into our culture from the East now. Here Satan seems to try to lure us away with more subtle gods. We peer across the border of our yard and we see that neighbor over there seemingly living a much more prosperous and fun life than we are. They don't seem to be burdened by all the rules and the regulations of Scripture. Perhaps their God is better than ours. Maybe he's not so demanding. Maybe he's more fun. Maybe I don't have to look so hard for him. Notice God was not content, though, to leave his kids to wander off. He was concerned for their well-being, and he orchestrated world events in order to draw them back to him. He orchestrated and pushed around kings, having them have campaigns coming right through Israel and capturing them in order to draw back his people to himself. He wanted them to experience what life was like outside of his care and blessing as they were led off into exile. Not so they would suffer, but so that they would come back to him and realize what a blessing he had been to them all along. One of the interesting benefits of this pandemic has been that we have focused on things that we have taken for granted many times. We've realized what it's like to do without certain things. Caused us to appreciate them even more. I've talked to dozens of our congregation members that are just hoping to come back here and, and have a simple service in our sanctuary something that we've taken for granted for a long time. Maybe for you it's that steady income that's been threatened. Maybe you thought it would go on indefinitely. Or maybe you're missing something as simple as entertainment, to be able to watch a baseball game on TV or go to a restaurant or the movies. All of these things are things that we are doing without now and hopefully are causing us and drawing us back to the Lord. Many people don't think twice about um, hugging or shaking hands when things are going on and going well. But nowadays, we look at that person like that person could be carrying the virus, something that we've taken for granted for many, many years. And as negative as all of this is, it can cause us, if we have the right mindset, to seek the Lord. We begin to realize how we really do need Him when these things are taken away. But this divine game of hide-and-seek has an amazing result, as we see in this letter from Jeremiah, Jeremiah. The plan culminates in restoration. If the only result for the exile was that the Israelites came back to their senses and put away their idols, it would have been worth it all, because they deserved God's judgment. But when we think about judgment uh, in, in regard to God and his children, we should never see it as punitive, in a punitive sense. An example of punitive judgment is our court system. Someone commits a crime and they're paid back, basically, through incarceration, fines, and even in some cases, death. 
They're paying their debt to society. But God has a loftier purpose in mind. He desires to discipline us. And punishment is never seen as paying him back for the harm that we caused him. The only time we see payback, actually, is on the cross, when Jesus paid for our sins. What he wants to do is draw us near to him so that he can prosper us. He does want to bless us. He's not a begrudging father. Well, I guess I have to give my kids something. No, it's only our sin and disobedience that restricts him from doing so. Jeremiah writes to the exiles on God's behalf. He says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortune, fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. In conclusion here, anytime you come face to face with pain in your life, whether it's financial, health-related, relational, or because you just did something stupid, it's good to pause and to ask the question, what is God trying to show me through this pain? Let the pain do its work. And even though no one likes pain, it's important because it shows us that something is wrong. This pandemic is causing a lot of pain, but that doesn't have to be a negative thing for the believer if we let that pain show us areas of our life where we need to seek the Lord again. Remember, his plan is to prosper you, not to harm you. He wants to give you hope and a future. And Father God, we come before you today. I pray for my brothers and sisters out there that are going through pain right now in their lives. And some of it's excruciating. Some of it's causing mental turmoil. They don't see the plan you have for them. They can't see hope for the future. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help them, help them to see you, even though you may be hidden right under the surface, Lord, that they would find you as hidden treasure. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, Jesus, sing it again, my heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Receive now the benediction from 1 Thessalonians 2, 16-17. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.